it is really great to be back here. It's been nostalgic to walk around and, and meet with people and, and see all the little things that have changed in the years. So I started at UC Berkeley in 2018. Um, and uh, since that time, I've been doing a lot of thinking about you know, what is it that a mechanical designer could be doing in the space of uh, physical interaction, okay? And so I've titled this talk, um, Robots That Aren't Afraid of Contact. This is actually after a workshop that I co-hosted at RSS in 2022, which is called The Science of Bumping Into Things. Um, and really the idea here is that um, you know, I, I, want, I want robots that don't have to be super delicate, that we can rely on, that we can take risks with and do really cool stuff. And I do think that mechanical design is really at the heart of that problem. So I run the Embodied Dexterity Group, that's what it's called. We call it EDGE at Berkeley. Um, and so as you can imagine, we're applying this to end effectors a lot of the time for dexterous manipulation. Um, and so for today, what I'm gonna do is tell you about two specific projects that I think are um, hopefully going to expand your thinking, whether you come from a computer science or data science background or you come from a mechanical background. Um, yes, and here you can see a teaser. So this is a suction cup. I love suction cups. They're great. They don't usually break. Um, and here you can see it having this kind of interesting haptic searching behavior. It's not guided by computer vision and there are no electronics in the cup itself and it's very cheap and easy to make. Well, easy is all relative, we'll get to that later. But um, this is the kind of interaction that I could think that we can use to supplement things like computer vision. Okay, so you can start guessing how you think that works. So before going into the details of those two projects, I want to start with just a little bit of my journey, starting from here at Stanford. So as Mark said, I did get my start on the Ocean One project, um, and I built the hands for this system. Um, and one of the most poignant moments of this project was when we were getting ready for a field mission and Osama was like, you know that if the hands fail, we can't do nearly a fraction of what we want to do in terms of demonstrating the whole robot. And that was terrifying as a PhD student, um, but it was also true, right? The hands and the contact points are the conduits through which we interact with the world. And so we need to think very carefully about them and we need to be able to rely on them. So what I learned from this experience, and it stayed with me since, is that we need to demonstrate resilience. Now resilience can come in many different forms. In this case, it just couldn't break. But it could also be something that's cheap or easy to replace. Maybe you don't need to have to recalibrate your system every time you replace hardware, those sorts of attributes. So hopefully this is something that you take away from this talk. Um, now, the other major influence for me was uh, working under Mark Kokoski. And this is my, one of my favorite quotes. I use it all the time in my talks. Um, like the performance of sports cars, uh, which ultimately is limited by the tires on its wheels, the performance of a robotic hand is limited by the skin on its fingers. I like this because it likens my work to race cars, which is super cool. Um, but also there's more to this quote, right? It's saying that you could have the coolest engine, you could have the coolest sports car you could possibly think of, but if you have bad tires, you can't access that capability. And in the same way, I'm really, really excited about the skin on our fingers and how that allows us to really um, embody the full breadth of, of um, performance that all the kinematics and dynamics and, and data science and everything that we do, that's really the conduit through which we do our work. So I think a lot about the mechanics of that contact and how it interfaces with the rest of the system. And it became clear that when we were working underwater, you know, your tires have treads. That's because your environment can get wet and that changes your contact. And so we needed to take into account the wetness of our environment in underwater hands. And so, of course, you can add suction to an underwater uh, gripper and this helps you grab stuff. And here are two other explorations where we actually reverse the flow to reduce contact in order to move this squishy object into the hand. Um, and then on this side, there's no signals here, but what we're doing is we're monitoring the flow rate going through the tube, and that gives us a sense of our contact conditions with the world. So imagine you're drinking boba. Everybody loves boba. Um, you can tell when one of those tapioca balls goes into your straw. You're not looking at it. You're not even feeling it with your skin. This is a pressure and flow phenomenon, okay? You're inferring what's going on through that. That's kind of what's happening here. All right, so what I got from these experiences are these two other properties, okay? So we can actually think about our environment 
in creative new ways like, hey, we're in a fluid. Let's not ignore that. And actually that opens doors to new mechanisms. So let's harness our environment in this contact regime. And then the second thing is that it's really useful to add a sense of touch, but it doesn't always have to be hard. It doesn't always have to be a lot of electronics. It could be inherent to how you're manipulating that contact. Okay, so we really want to add that sense of touch. Embodied intelligence gets you a lot of the way, but um, we wanna have a feedback control as well. Okay, so these are the three principles that I'm going to be demonstrating hopefully throughout this talk. Um, and hopefully this talk gives you sort of new ideas in this space. This is not meant to be a thesis of like, these are the, th the three only principles of robots in the real world um, who aren't afraid of contact, but I think they cover a lot. So I got my start in underwater robotics. And uh, as Mark alluded to, I did continue that work in underwater systems. So here we literally designed treads for fingertips in lubricated conditions and found an optimum solution, which is a little odd. It's not a normal skin geometry. Um, in March of 2020, we were in French Polynesia doing field testing with this uh, spine gripper. As you can imagine, that uh, project did not continue after March of 2020, so it wasn't published very much, um, but we, we were in the field. And we've even done some fish-inspired work that Stanley Wong here contributed to, it's under review right now, um, and uh, thinking about how we can use the fluids around the, the robot to do fish-inspired manipulation. But we evolved outside of the ocean, um, and so we've also looked at the ground and how we can understand the mechanics of this inter interaction in systems. So we designed the first legged robot that's able to actually pull itself, its whole body underground, which takes many times the amount of uh, force that it has in gravity and its weight. We then translated some of these modeling tools to understand how we can drive the wheels better of a rover that is stuck on the moon. And actually it turns out that you wanna drive the wheels at different speeds, which is different from on a hard material where you want them all to go the same speed. And that was just an assumption a lot of rovers had had previously. And then we even thought about the capstan effect and how friction interacts with cables in real world environments. Okay, but not as many people work on granular media or underwater environments as there are people who work in the air, okay? So I would say the vast majority of roboticists, especially in academic environments, are in labs on Earth, and that Earth has an atmosphere, okay? So unless you're solely working on systems for underwater or in the vacuum of space, air is the medium that we need to think about, okay? And so I'm presenting sort of the inclusion of air in creative new ways into our robotic grippers. Um, but in fact, this is not a new concept. Um, how do we harness the environment? How do we harness the air around us in gripping? Well, there's a couple of really straightforward and important ways that we already do this. One is the suction cup. So suction cups do not work in the vacuum of space. They rely on the fact that we have a, a fluid around us and it's pressurized, okay? So we need to have a pressure differential between PA and PB in order for this mechanism to work. So this is harnessing our environment in contact. And um, these are very, very successful mechanisms. Um, this is just a screenshot from McMaster showing all the different kinds of suckers that are out there. This is not a one and done kind of thing. There's actually quite a lot of intricate and beautiful design that's happening in this space with single cast rubber materials. And you can even see interesting sort of porous, this is like a granola bar, um, objects that these are able to grip onto. Now the, the wide variety that is available to us is because we need to be able to grip onto different types of objects and to apply different loads to them. And so that's where we get a lot of specialization and less generality, okay? So how do we translate this to more general applications? Well, I would argue that we need a sense of touch. Okay, so if we're going to overcome the limitations of not being hyper-specialized for one specific object or scenario, then we're gonna have to have some sort of feedback control to actively um, compensate for that deficit. And I would say that suction cups, I mean, who's, who here has worked with a suction gripper at some point? Wow, oh my gosh, you guys, get some suction grippers in here, okay? They're good stuff. Um, so what I would say is, well, I thought everybody was gonna raise their hand, um, but I think that one of the reasons why these are broadly adopted is because they inherently demonstrate the resilience that we need in our systems, right? You can just plug one in, it works. If it breaks, you unplug it, you plug another one in, and it works, okay? You don't need a PhD in robot hand building to use one of these things. 
Um, and again, we're using the environment. So that's where we leave this last opportunity for sense of touch. So um, in suction grippers, this is still uh, an important and hot area of research. How do we plan for and deploy our suction grippers to grab onto, let's say, objects in unstructured environments? And here's um, a, a highly cited work from the Amazon uh, Robotics Challenge. And here you can see that it's trying multiple times to pick up this um, binder. It fails, and then eventually it succeeds. The way that this research is often done is really based on computer vision or predictive planning. Okay, so can we look at a scene, identify what we want to grasp, and then grasp it successfully? Um, and then the next thing is that there can be some feedback on the suction. So you can see that it just lifts and then goes straight back down when it's not successful. They are, I do believe, using some sort of pressure sensor to say whether it's engaged or not. But it's treated sort of as a binary and is not used during grasping. And that means that during grasping, the grasp location is not modified. So that's where we come in with our smart suction cup to say, well, can we use vision plus tactile sensing? So vision is going to be used to choose the initial grasp point, but then haptics is used to modify it. And can we not think of grasp success just in these binary terms, but if we're close to a successful grasp, can we use that information and move to the right location? And then finally, we're going to modify our grasp after initial contact. So I asked you earlier if somebody, uh, if, to think about how you thought this works. Now you can see how close you are. So this is a single cast silicone rubber structure. But there are these uh, four walls or four chambers that are inside of it. And so the flow actually breaks up, goes through all four chambers, and then it comes back together and it goes through this single, let's see, this single uh, suction line. So the flow goes up through all four chambers and then up and through here. These penetrate here at a uh, pressure sensor. So there's no uh, flow kind of going through those continuously. Um, and each uh, pressure transducer is therefore effectively measuring the wall pressure of this little pipe, right? Who, whoever's taken fluids will know that pressure is related to flow rate. Okay. So we're able to get differential pressure flows within this cup. Here's another look at this. So here's that connector. So all the flow goes up and then this way. And this is where the flow comes in, breaks up, and then all goes through here as it goes up into the suction line. Um, and this can be, yes, this can be quite small. Here is the suction cup, ta-da. It always looks bigger when it's on the slides. Um, I actually think it would make our lives easier if we made it bigger, um, but they, they can be quite small and it's done in a single cast uh, silicone process. Um, and so, so of course this is flow based, so we did some preliminary simulations to understand how the flow would change within the cup. Um, and so you can see here on the top, that um, we've got a leak going upwards. So imagine you're on a PCV with a little via that's breaking your seal. You're going to see that flow goes up through this chamber, and then, uh, and then we're going to get a, a differential pressure between the two sides. And you can have other scenarios as well. But basically, you're able to compare the different channels to each other to get that information. OK, so here's what it looks like when you're pulling that suction cup off of an FTIR surface, where the bright is uh, the contact um, and the dark is no contact. Um, and so you can see that over a very short period of time, you get these kind of catastrophic popping or, or breaking off um, failures. And what's happening here is that you actually have a leak point such that the air shoots across. And so we would expect that maximum flow would be in chamber four. And you can see that the purple chamber four is lower than these other chambers and so is getting affected more than the others. So we're seeing sort of the physical trends we would expect. Um, and that's what that looks like with the air shooting across. So with that, we were like, OK, this is some cool data. We've got something physical that's happening. What do we do with it? So we went across the hall to Ken Goldberg and said, hey, what can we do with this data? And he was like, well, let's, let's do a predictive model. Okay, So let's try to actually um, feel what's happening inside of the cup to say when and at what edge of the cup the failure is going to occur. Um, and we found that we were able to somewhat do a predictive uh, model with just the suction cup. And then it, performed very similarly to a load cell. Um, but it was still really interesting and a good confirmation that we were able to get some predictions. So that's where we pretty much left the like failure prediction. I think there's more to do there. Um, so you could imagine, as you're picking up this object, feeling that it's torquing, and then how it's moving, and then actually adjusting your grasp on the fly. 
But what I'm really interested in is that, that old question I brought up. So how do we actually adjust our grasp after we're making contact? And I think one of the reasons why there are so many different suction cups is because of the different materials. So you have the granola bar, you have smooth surfaces. Um, what if you can't perceive the texture that's gonna make or break your suction grasp? So right for now on, I'm gonna be focusing mostly on texture. So in this video here, what you can see is that the suction cup is sliding across a rough um, piece of acrylic and then a smooth piece of acrylic. And when we first come onto the surface, we get this intermediate. So this is just the average of all the chambers. And then we get a full engagement reading when it goes onto the smooth. So this is how we're getting these like rich intermediate values. Okay, so we're gonna use that information to do this. So you can see that the cup um, is actually edge following. I'll, it'll show again. So we start at this point, that's um, computed by vision, and then we get this interesting edge following behavior, and then it ultimately will grasp on top of an integrated circuit and resistors and everything. So it's a, a bumpy surface, but it's able to find just the right location to grasp this successfully. So what's the controller? How are we actually doing this? Okay, remember I told you we're not using vision and we're just using those four pressure sensors. It's actually shockingly simple. Um, so what we have is uh, right here, I've labeled sort of the four cardinal directions. We subtract the ones that are opposite from each other. So I can say left or right, which one has more suction engagement? Okay, this one does, go this way. That's essentially, that's it. <laughs> and then we do it in two directions, okay? Um, so that's what this is doing, is, is just adding those together. We actually do take a unit vector, that's why the, the uh, motion is just constant speed. Um, I, it's just not shown here. Um, and then you can also do a very similar thing using rotation. So similarly, left, right, which one's better? This one's better. Go towards, or in that case, go this way so that this one comes into contact better. So you can do this in those two different dimensions. And this is what it looks like. So we also added a scaling factor, alpha, um, to scale how much we rotate versus how much we translate. So alpha equals zero is with rotation off, so only sliding. And then one is just rotation about uh, an approximate contact point. And you can then change alpha. I believe this is alpha of 0.5, but I, I don't exactly remember. But you can see that it's both translating and rotating. Um, and again, only using these four pressure sensors, it successfully grasps. I will also note that we're using the unit vector defined by these four readings. We don't calibrate it. We just literally say like, what is your pressure? We don't need to like zero things or do anything fancy just because we're basically the way that we're using the data. Okay, so we wanted to see if this actually helps, right? So if we go back to that bin picking um, challenge, let's say we have some algorithm that selects our initial grasp point. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use that algorithm. We actually got a version of DexNet from Ken Goldberg. We did not retrain it. We just changed the robot arm and the gripper and, and the camera and then just applied it. So you can, you know, we expect there to be some error. Um, so it's gonna find the best grasp point that it thinks we should go for. We're then gonna go there and then do sort of an iterative search process for a certain amount of time. If the time passes and we haven't succeeded, we fail. If we have succeeded at any point, meaning that we detect that our overall pressure magnitude is high enough to indicate that we're fully sealed, then we're successful where we try to move it. Um, and this is what this looks like. This is real time, it's not sped up or anything. Um, so we look at that point, we approach the object. This is kind of subtle, but we come in and it's gonna start moving because it does not detect a successful grip. And so it's gonna move until it detects that it's successful, and then it's gonna pick up the object and move it. So would that grasp have been successful without haptic search? No. Okay, so that's what allowed it to be successful. Um, and so we wanted to challenge this again. So we're, we're setting this up for vision to fail. Like I know that, and there are gonna be cases where if vision is perfect, you don't need the sense of touch. But we want to challenge the system, right? We want to find the, the role that tactile sensing has. Um, and so we didn't go with basic or typical objects, we chose adversarial objects, which in this publication is defined as with few available suction grasp points. Meaning I give you this object, most of the surface would not be successful based on suction gripping, maybe it's porous or too bumpy, but there's some places to grasp. So the question is, can we find them? 
And they could also be black or shiny or transparent or whatever feature makes it difficult to perceive. So here are the results. This is the, um, just the GQCNN predictive location. And you can see that this is in fact a very difficult task. So we only get up to about 25% of the objects successfully gripped. And we're allowing it to go up to 50 total trials. Each one of these lines is one uh, bin picking trial. And then the solid line is the, um, the average. Our best alpha, which was 0.25, which means more lateral and a little bit of rotation, um, was able to get us up to, in the best case scenario, about 75% success. In the worst, you know, it's, it was still about the same as before, but on average we got a much better improvement. And then just to make sure that just randomly moving around the bin wasn't helping, we did a random search. So this is just coming into that point and then randomly moving around to see if we can get a better spot. And you can see that it's not all that much better than this one was. Okay, so hopefully what I've shown you is that you can start to implement a sense of touch in a way that shouldn't compromise your system mechanically and can give you some information that can make manipulation more successful. But this is really just a start. So this is the invention of the technology, but that leaves a lot to do in terms of how we actually control the system. So here I'm gonna show you some failures. Um, which is usually a good thing to do. So one is oscillation, meaning we're at a point where if I go left or right, I keep figuring out that I need to go back the other way because I'm at a local optimum, but it's not enough to actually grip. So I'm never gonna find a better location. Another one here is I'm literally in contact with the object, but it's so porous that I don't get any meaningful change in my pressure, or the pressure change is the same in all directions. And then finally, um, the pushing uh, issue, which is I'm trying to slide my gripper across something and this is sticky silicone, and so it just moves the object, so there's no relative uh, position change. So I think that this is kind of a, an interesting place to start, thinking about other types of controllers or designs. Um, for a conference paper, we recently looked at this last one to see if we could improve this through literally just picking up our gripper. So if you um, still use the haptic information, but then instead of sliding, you just lift it every time you take a step, um, the idea is that you can uh, overcome this issue. Um, now, the question was though, as you're touching and interacting with the object, you might move it a little bit. So how useful is it really? Um, and we wanted to try and apply this to uh, PCB uh, recycling handling on uh, conveyor lines. So here, it's not moving, it's not on a conveyor yet, but you can see that our haptic regrasp gets to where it needs to go fairly quickly, and a random search may or may not. Okay. Um, and so here, uh, we're calling these level two. Level two, what we mean is that there are intact uh, integrated circuits, and it is quite bumpy, but it's not so bumpy with like large connectors that you would harm your suction cup or like tear it in some way if you push too hard. Um, level one would be it's pre-processed, and so all of the ICs have been stripped off, and those are just much easier to grip. And so these ones had the larger effect, um, where you, uh, when you just have random search, um, you takes a lot of jumps to get a little bit of benefit, um, but with the haptic search, you get a lot of benefit within just a couple jumps and successfully grip. Um, and so here is the first attempt on a conveyor system. As you can see, you do get some movement of the PCB because they're not perfectly coordinated um, between the conveyor and the arm. But we do find that despite this and in a very simple um, vision-based like center locator, um, where we are able to improve grasping on, on the next attempt, and we can improve it um, just by trying again uh, quite a bit. Now, we didn't find that the effect of haptics versus random was smaller because we're moving the object. So the haptic search is going to respond in a way that is seemingly more random. Um, and so this is where I think there's an opportunity to bring computer vision to then adjust for object movement at the same time. All right, this is under review, so hopefully we'll find out soon, sooner or later whether it's accepted. Okay, so I'm finishing up on this project now um, where I think I just wanted to like pitch this. I think I've got a bunch of 
students here who are hopefully some of which doing a robot manipulation. Maybe some of you will get more into suction cups, but I'm like, I'm right across the bay and I'm ready to see this tra technology translate, okay? So it is still in its prototyping phase. It may still tear, it may still break, but um, I would really love to work with researchers, especially in um, computer vision labs, in labs that are more CS based, to see if we can work together to make this the next like gel site, right? Everybody uses gel site. Well, could this be the gel site of suction cups? That's kind of my hope. So if you wanna work with me on that, um, please reach out. Okay, so I'm gonna transition now to another tactile sensing technology. And I wanna pause just to talk a little bit more in depth about sensor integration into um, soft structures, because uh, a lot of hands are soft. So what I'm gonna do is plot uh, a couple of different just example technologies. And what I wanna show you is the distance from the contact to the transducer. So the transducer is the element that is translating your physical um, stimulus to electrical signals. So this is usually where you have the introduction of electronics, as well as some need to have batteries or wireless communication or wires, you know? And so that, to me, is where a lot of potential failure points emerge. Wires, they're the worst. Okay. So starting at the closest side, you have a lot of technologies, you've got capacitive. Um, here we've got a force uh, sensitive resistor. We've also got some really cool sort of like fluid channel type technologies um, that are integrated directly into the gripper itself. And if we move a little bit farther, um, you start to get some interesting new technologies. Uh, well, I think they're new, um, but they're, let's just say they're less common, but they've been around for a while. Um, but acoustic, right, so you can use acoustics within structures um, to understand sort of where contact is and get your transducer just a little bit farther away from that contact point. And then vision, we've got gel site, which could be centimeters away, um, and people are working to move it farther and farther away from that contact point for resiliency. And then I've even showed you today an example of a connected um, device where the transducer with flow can be very far away, but it's still sort of like th through these channels and tubes. And some other people have done various pressure fluids and stuff. Okay. Now, the last category, the one that's the farthest away, is where you basically are transmitting the information through air. Okay, so you could do this with sight. You just have a camera and you're looking at your manipulation. You can infer things about contact. And same with sound. You can listen to the contacts as they're happening and infer what's going on. And those are great because you just need a camera or a microphone. Anybody can do that, right? Um, and so we can bridge this entire spectrum. And while it's not a hard and fast rule, I would generally say that ease of adoption and resilience tends to get better as you move farther and farther away from the contact point. But there is this issue that I see where the reason why we want tactile sensors closer to the contact is so that we can measure things directly like force and pressure, right? That's, that's physically relevant versus um, on this side, you have to just infer what's going on. It's just a, a, a different type of interpretation problem. Um, but on this side, you need to be physically connected. You need tubes or wires or something. And on this side, you get the benefit of not. So what I want to do is do both, okay? So I want a tactile sensor that's measuring something like normal force, right? Something I want. Um, but have it not be physically connected. So let's think about air. Air, we can use it as a sensing medium, right? That's what I've shown you already. As flow is going into and out of our system, we can measure how that action is happening. But flow is also an actuator, okay? So think of a flute. I think a flute is a beautiful touch sensor, right? You put air over this part, so you're actuating it. When I say actuation, I mean vibrations, okay? And then you change the contact state of this device and it makes beautiful different frequencies. So our measurement is frequency. We can do that using just a simple microphone. And guess what? You could have a whole orchestra of flutes playing all sorts of different notes and you can detect those, again, with a single microphone. So this is the kind of, of sort of transmission of information that I'd like to have. Okay, so here's our flute. <laughs>
this is where it gets a little more interesting. Okay. So hopefully that reminds you of childhood and playing with toy trains or whatever you did um, with, with musical instruments. Um, but we're, what we're calling this is acoustac. Okay, so it's acoustic-based tactile sensing where when I say not connected, I do, I do acknowledge that there is a pump, right? So the actuator is connected, but the sensing itself is not, okay? So it's going through the air as sound. Um, okay, and so here we have what's a, a tin whistle, which is probably closest to what I just showed you, um, where the red part is called the fipple. This is the knife edge where the flow is going to go across and actually oscillate against that knife edge to create the vibrations. And then we've got the resonant tube, which kind of manipulates the frequency in different ways based on length and holes and so forth. So this is what one of the taxels or tactile pixels looks like, where we have a 3D printed structure with the knife edge and with part of the, uh, the resonant tube here. And then this is what that would look like from the top and then from the side. Of course, it makes sound. Um, and so how does this work? Well, just to give you some intuition, what we have is the function of frequency getting omitted is uh, inversely related to the length, okay? So we have this compliant cap at the end, and as we apply a force, it will compress, which will reduce the effective length, and therefore it's going to increase the frequency. Okay, so that's it. And this is assuming very simple harmonics. It's more just for understanding, not necessarily like a true model. Um, okay, so we did some testing of this just to calibrate and understand. Um, and so this is what generally the signals will look like. So um, we have the raw signal, we then do a spectrogram. In this case, we're just looking for the brightest point. Um, and so that's how we get a single line from the data. So this is what it looks like when you're looking at all four of them. So what we've done is we've chosen four different lengths of tube such that they're in different frequency ranges. And this would be a very simple way to get multiple measures at the same time without them overlapping. Um, and when you zoom into one of them, this is what the signal looks like as we apply a force um, and the frequency. This is not a great signal. Okay, it's, it <laughs> goes up and down. How do you know what your force actually is if you get a reading, especially in this lower region? Okay. So what we think is actually going on, and I would say this is just a hypothesis, so we have not proven this, but what's happening is you have this flexible dome, and you can actually feel when it's, when it's uh, whistling without contact and you gently touch the top, you can feel little vibrations. So it's not a perfectly closed system like this would indicate. It might be some intermediate, like semi-open sort of approximation. So it's, it's um, transitioning from 2L to 4L, and so that's why we would get this up and down, uh, back and forth at the initial contact. So we're designers, so we're like, well, let's just design it out. Let's take it, take it away. So first, we're going to change thickness. If you have a thicker cap, might be stiffer, might have less of an issue. Also, let's add a hole. This one is a little less intuitive, but um, when you add, when you have an open system, you might need a different amount of flow to get it to resonate. So what we're actually doing is changing how much flow we need to resonate it in, when we're contacting it or not, and that'll make sense later. And then finally, we just added mass. So if you add mass, it'll be closer to closed. This is actually my personal favorite. It works really well, um, but I'm not gonna show you the results. Just know that it works. Okay, so and then there's going to be a key up there as to the different properties and um, that we're testing. Okay, so let's look at one without a hole and one with a hole. You can see they have very similar trends when contact is made with a little bit of shift um, for whatever non-idealities. But when you look at the amplitude of this signal, you can see that the one with the hole starts very quiet and then gets loud versus the one that's always uh, closed um, is always very loud. And so you could create an amplitude threshold to then filter out when you're not making contact and get a lovely uh, uh, non, um, or a lovely monotonic signal um, using that process. Um, and so of course, if you change the thickness, you can get different sorts of sensitivities. Um, and then uh, you might need to have different thresholding based on the size of the hole. And in fact, if you want to measure really light forces, you want to be more open without contact, so a larger hole. Okay, so this hole is what makes us such that we have signals that are off when there's no contact being made. Okay, 
So this is just sort of like a creative exploration of this possible space. Um, but what we're finding is that this could be applied in many different ways. So if we think of this again and now put it on a finger, why not? Um, so now we have a resonant tube, which is this silicone structure, which is now pasted onto the side of the finger, like so. Make sense? And this is what it's going to look like when we stretch it. So when you stretch it, the frequency goes down, as you might expect. Um, and this is non-hysteretic and has a nice, nice clean signal. So why don't we uh, put this back on the finger? And as we bend the finger, the tube is going to get stretched a little bit because it's not right on the, the right bending axis. And so we can get a fairly good measure of curvature, again, without contact. So it would be harder to do with contact. Um, and then for the fun of it, let's put a hole in here and let's see what happens. You can get pre-touch. So before you actually touch the surface, you start to get some signals uh, before contact occurs, which is kind of cool. But you also just know whether you're in contact or not. Um, and then here is what it would look like in a robotic gripper, where on the top you have pose is actually just in one finger and then contact is in the other finger. Um, and so here you can see that the finger curls and we get contact. Some interesting things happening with contact, but then you can see when it gets lost, when the object gets pulled out of the hand, but curvature is still uh, measuring. Okay, so. This was sort of just a, a second exploration of how we could harness air um, in a way that is just not typical, okay? So thinking of it not just as you know, a thing that we have to deal with or a thing that can help us grip harder or a thing to help us sense, but actually to now communicate information. And I find this fascinating because this is how we communicate information. I'm literally using my lungs to like push air through my vocal cords and yell at you guys about how to do this. <laughs> so uh, I think it's kind of a, just a fun, a fun thing that emerged unexpectedly. Now, there is something that we need to talk about. So you might just be careful. There's some sound. Oh, wait. OK. So at first, it was really loud. We're going down the hall. And we're going we're gonna to turn the corner. You can still tell the contact state of your robot. OK. So this is great if you want to, let's say, go to um, a place that has a different atmosphere. Maybe you want this to be on Mars. Well, sound attenuates a lot faster in that environment, and so you're going to have to be very loud to make this work. Um, but this is a little bit of an issue. You know, we did this at night. We wore ear protection. This is not safe around people in a regular basis. Um, and it's going to be something that you can tune based on your environment, whether it's loud or quiet or so forth. And so there is sort of some questions as to how do you process this data in more complex soundscapes, um, and how do you tune the design accordingly. Um, for human safety, though, I do have a student, Jade, who is working on the ultrasonic version. So hopefully it's something that people can have in their own homes and totally annoy their pets. <laughs> okay. So um, I think this is just my like last food for thought. You know, when I watch Star Wars or I see these movies where the robots literally have like a beep boop robot language, there's a part of me that wonders like, that should have contact information. Like that should be based on the physical state of that robot. It's not for people. This is a language for robots, maybe between different parts of the body. Maybe I have a microphone on my head, and I've got air going to my fingers, and I know what my contact is because I'm communicating that. So just food for thought and think about what robot language we should be having in our systems. OK, so to conclude, um, these are the tenants that I've been really fascinated with. We want to make sure that we're harnessing the environment, maybe in ways that you haven't always thought about. So think about the air that you're in and, and how this can influence your designs. We need to demonstrate resilience. At the end of the day, robots are not going to make an impact unless people can rely on them. And I feel very strongly about that, and that's why we've done this exploration of sort of these really passive, interesting uh, structures. And then finally, though, just because embodied intelligence morph morphological computation is great doesn't mean that we shouldn't have active sensing. So I think it would be a mistake to, to just ignore that altogether. It might not, every sensing modality might not make sense in every scenario, but I think it would be a little bit uh, silly to just ignore it altogether. 
Um, and then I want to thank and acknowledge the incredible work of the students in the lab. Um, and actually this, I couldn't go to bars this year, but this warmed my heart to see Mark and Paul with my students. And my students came back, we're like, oh, I got to meet them. So that was really fun. Um, and then I just want to acknowledge that uh, the suction cup work is funded by the Hong Kong Center for Logistics Robotics. Um, and the two students who are currently in my lab working on this are Jung Pio Lee and Sebastian Lee. If you're interested in suction cups, reach out. Um, Monica Lee did the sound-based, sort of flow-based sensors, or um, sound, acoustic sensors. She's now a postdoc with Rebecca Kramer, um, doing some super, super cool stuff. And then Tae Meng Ha, who you saw throughout both projects, is now a faculty member at UC Santa Cruz. So if you want to do cool tactile sensing, definitely check out his stuff. And then um, I had, I really seriously considered giving a whole talk on human assistance. I decided against it because I feel like I need just like one more year and then I'll be ready to give the whole talk. It's our newest set of projects and it also started during the pandemic and with human subject studies, just a little slow. But we're doing some really cool stuff on how do you actually get a person and a human to share the responsibility of grasping? And how does that influence their sense of agency as well as their performance? Um, so if you're, if you're in that space, please check out our website and I'm happy to, to tell you all about it. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and conclude here and take any questions. Have you guys looked into multiple suction cups, all that have, you know, uh, like the haptic sensing, and then could they together figure out the best way to pick up something? So the question was an array of suction cups with this kind of technology. Um, we have thought about it. We have not done the work. Um, so I think it's a great idea. Um, you could imagine even just each suction cup having one pressure sensor. And then when you look at the array of suction cups, and actually I think hardware-wise, you don't have to then produce a suction cup. You just need the hardware to integrate the pressure sensor um, into your array. Um, pressure sensors are not like the cheapest things. It's like tens of dollars per pressure sensor. So, but that's, I mean, as compared to a lot of robotic systems, that's fairly cheap. So I think you're onto a good idea to apply uh, pressure sensing in this more analog regime to uh, arrays, yes. I do think that there is some interesting interaction between the chambers when they are physically coupled onto a single pressure line. So I don't know if it would be, um, like I'd have, to, I'd have to look at those signals to say what you could do with it. Yeah. How well does this like acoustic sensing work in extremely loud, like noisy environments? Yes. So um, I don't know if the questions are gotten on the microphone, but the question was, uh, what about the acoustics in loud environments? Um, I think this is something you would have to uh, design for the application. So you could probably measure like the ambient sounds of a factory floor. And there might be certain regimes of uh, frequency that are kind of available to you, um, or you're able to um, make it loud enough and there, there's not a safety risk, right? So I wouldn't say it's like a plug it into every scenario kind of thing, but I think if you're loud enough, you can probably do whatever you want. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, for the suction cups, I guess how, when you're translating to like the real world, how much does like dust and dirt like affect the success rate from the suction cups? Yes. So dust and dirt is it's going to be a problem for most suction cups, right? Um, but they are used in various messy, wet environments, so there must be some sort of mechanism or cleaning or filtering that, that is already available. So it's a great question to, to just know what's available now in industry. Um, you are right, though, that it could additionally clog the sensing mechanism, right? So we have these more intricate internal features. What if over time one of the chambers starts to get more and more clogged and then we start to get biased in one direction? Um, amazing question. I don't have the answer to that. I, I do think, you know, um, if, if we were really serious about translating this like as a, as a startup or something like that, we would have to choose a specific application, test it, see how it failed. And, and I think you just hit upon one potential failure point for commercialization, um, but likely has solutions based on the application at hand. When you were developing the acoustic session cups, did you ever make any songs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've asked this 
student to make like a cool sound ball thing that you could like press. And the, the problem is that um, this is an analog. Um, it's changing gradually as you press more or less. A flute doesn't do that. You press it down, it makes one frequency. You release it, it, plays, it makes another, which gives you the ability to make chords that sound very nice. This system is going to be inherently discordant because you're, you've got, let's say you've got a chord, and then you change all the, the things just a little bit. Like one's a little sharp, one's a little flat. It's just going to sound awful. Um, but I think that potentially you could start to play with the human interaction. I, I, think, I think there's a lot of potential because we share that hearing that you could think about how people perceive this, this information and, and if there are more positive or more negative experiences. I, I think that would be really fun to study. We did, we did think about doing more like discrete signaling, but then you kind of tend to introduce hysteresis into the systems. So like if you have something that you have to pluck, that means you need to push a certain distance and then you get the sound, but then you have to kind of reset. It just was a little bit more of an interesting design problem. Uh, what are the challenges to these suction cups uh, when you are uh, gripping sharp obstacles? Yes. Yeah, so I think I'm going to have the same question as before with the clogging. There's got to be suction cups that are meant for sharper, more abrasive surfaces, right? So one question I would have is how do they deal with that? We have not explicitly dealt with that ourselves. And so the rubber that we're choosing may or may not be appropriate. Also, we're introducing some finer features inside that might just be more sensitive to potential tearing. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's not a neutral. Like I kind of I played it as a neutral. Like, we haven't changed the resilience at all. That's not true. Um, we have, but I think we'd have to do a little bit more to understand that. Um, and I think those kinds of problems will emerge when people start using them for hundreds or thousands of cycles or using them in particular scenarios. Um, so that's a good question. Um, I just have a um, question related to the like soft interfaces you use. Like when you're choosing the material uh, specifically, like you want this to be the to have the elasticity you're looking for, and also like not be too sensitive to like humidity level, for example, and like temperature. Like some of these could be uh, could change the elasticity of the material significantly, right? Uh, what are the like decisions? Yeah, so uh, you're asking a question that a lot of soft roboticists tend to ignore, which is, um, you know, soft materials are going to be sensitive to fatigue, to sunlight, to temperature, to a lot of things, right? And we tend to say, well, it's soft, so we can run into something and it'll be fine, <laughs> right? That's our definition. That sort of short-term impact, physical blunt impact is what we typically term as resilience. Um, but if you leave it out in the sun for a couple days, that might change, right? And so um, I think that there are real serious materials questions that need to emerge when we're making any soft robotic structure. Now, when we're relying on that soft robotic structure for sensation as well, um, it's going to be double fold, right? And then we need to understand how that influences the readings. Um, but I would say that on the spectrum of, of resilience in tactile sensors, I would bet my money on something that's just a soft structure as compared to something that then also has electronics or other parts sort of integrated with more um, potential areas for, for uh, strain failure. Um, so yeah, you're, you're asking a really good question. I don't have the answer to, but I think it is something a lot of people gloss over. We take maybe one more, and then I'm sorry, we probably have to move out to the patio because there's another course here at the I'm a robot and I work in a gym and I wanna I wanna pick up a dumbbell, right? Okay. Now if I have one of those suction cups and I pick up like only one side of the dumbbell, the mm -hmm. dumbbell's gonna wanna like snap off, right? Mm -hmm. How do you do you take into account like any like the center of gravity of objects or are you just picking up objects that are so light that it doesn't really matter? Yes. Do you envision my my gym robot or Yeah. So we are currently using a form of um, like algorithm that does not take into account center of gravity. 
So um, they are light enough, usually, that it won't fail based on sort of the torque due to gravity. If I was making a, a robot for lifting a dumbbell, I'm not even sure I would necessarily assume a suction cup is the right solution. Um, I think that in that case, sort of mechanical, like instead of relying on the air pressure, you might want interlocking in some interesting way with fingers. Um, so I, I like the posing of like, let's look at a specific scenario and think through what are the most important properties for design and selection of system. I think that's what I'm really hearing. I think this smart suction cup will make sense a lot of times in certain scenarios, and it won't make sense in others. Um, so it's more generalized than any suction cup, but not quite as generalized as, as any task. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much, everyone. This was a pleasure.